Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joe's Classic Video Games back with another cool arcade game repair video for you today. Look at what we have got here in our store. This is Atari's classic pole position arcade game. This thing came out in 1982 and it's broken. I like to say broke, but everybody keeps correcting me and saying that it's not broke, it's broken. It's broken. It don't work. Which is common for pole position. So if you don't know, this is one of the most popular games of the early 80s. And it was also one of the most uh, technically complex, we'll say. And so they broke early and often. So uh, it's hard to find one that actually works right. And this one doesn't either. So we're going to attempt to fix it. Now, traditionally, in the past, uh, you know, we've been doing this, I don't know. 20 years now or something like that, something close to that. And uh, whenever we first started, we bought a couple pole positions. You know, you'd buy games that pop up, and they would be working, and you'd get all these weird things happening, like you'd move the thing, and it wouldn't work anymore. And then you move it back where it was, and it would start working again, and just weird stuff like that. So they're very temperamental uh, historically, right? Yeah, but I, over the years, I've learned a lot more. So at first we shied away from them. We didn't. We stopped buying them and would not mess with them. There's a few games that we don't really mess with that are very popular games just because they're uh, they're tough to fix. So this is one of them. This is probably the, the most famous one. A pole position is tough to fix. Uh, and then we usually don't mess with Operation Wolf. We've owned several Tato Operation Wolfs that had all kinds of problems. The cabinets aren't really built that great. They're a little thinner. So this is a big old three-quarter inch plywood for a uh, uh, MDF, OSB, whatever, <laughs> particle board, um, and the the Operation Wolves were a little bit thinner. They were like five eighths, so they they were a little, not quite as solid as a regular arcade game. And the boards have a lot of problems. So Operation Wolf, we kind of stay away from. Pole position, we kind of stay away from too. Um, but over the years, we've had a few more that we worked on and did a little better job of getting the power right on them and things like that, and got them where they worked a little better. And then over the years, we've gotten a little better at board repair and things like that. So we're to the point now where we're willing to at least try to fix some pole positions again. And we're going to go over all the different things that can happen with a pole position and uh, why they're not that, um, why they're not that um, reliable and if there's anything we can do about that. So we got this one in off of a buddy of ours. He sold it to us. It was having problems. Um, wasn't working because of some power issues and I think other things, but we'll see. Um, but it's in pretty, it's pretty clean, good looking little game. So let's check out the cabinet first. Looks like there's a little bit of damage down there where maybe there was some uh, tape on it at some point. But all in all, pretty decent. Side art looks good. Doesn't look like it has a ton of water damage at least. Same for the front, looks pretty good. Looks like somebody's probably repainted it black, looks nice. The control panel looks good, but they usually do. Um, so one of the places that you get a lot of wear on these is right here. Look at this, that's how you know it's official, people. Those are cigarette burns, and there's a bunch of them. Usually they're not quite this bad, but whatever the, wherever this place was, they had a ton of people smoking when they were playing. Um, doesn't really bother me, you know, I mean, some customers are not going to want it with that, but all of them have it. And again, like I was saying, it's hard to even buy a pole position, much less one that's working, so I, had, I think we'll have no problem selling it, even with the cigarette burns on it. The bezel is beautiful. These are always in nice shape. Um, this one certainly is, still in nice silk screen shape. There is a video here on YouTube somewhere of the Atari factory, and it shows them silk screening these bezels. Back when this game was being built, they built a bunch of them, and it showed this big machine they have that was making the bezels. Really cool. Uh, and then here's the original marquee. Same thing with this. These are usually still in good shape, and this one is. Looks great. So over the years, again, they made a ton of them, so there were a bunch of them, and they're always broke. So over the years, this is one of those games that they threw away a lot. A lot of people would take the monitor out of it, take the board out of it, and trash the cabinet, unfortunately. 
But they made so many of them that there's probably still tons of them around. So this one, this side's in pretty good shape too. Now I was talking about water damage. Um, let's get down on the floor and see if we can figure out if there's any water damage. A lot of times whenever games were uh, operated, they didn't always stay in the same spot. A lot of people assume that that you, they would buy the game and put it in a bowling alley and then it would stay there for 10 years. That's not how that worked. They would. I worked for an operator for a while, um, 15 years ago. Um, and the, the, the way it works is you put the game in a location that there's levels of locations. So some locations get the brand new games and then you would move it out of that location when another new game came in to replace it and you would take this one to your next level of location, right? So you might, maybe the bowling alley gets brand new games. You take it out of the bowling alley and then you move it over to the, once it gets a little old, you move it to the skating rink. Well, that's the newest game in the skating rink even though it's five months old. Once it's been there for a while and it's not making as much money, you move it out of the skating rink and maybe it's in the, the candy store or whatever, who knows. But usually they would move them around. If it broke and they couldn't fix it on location, uh, they would pick it up and move it. So these spent a lot of time on like the back of pickup trucks and stuff like that getting moved around from time to time. And then after they had what I would call the final break, you know, <laughs> after they broke so much that the operator couldn't make money on them anymore, they, they would end up in a warehouse somewhere, which may or may not have had a leaky roof or a flooding floor or whatever. So it's really common to, to see these where they have been they have been damaged by rain or a flood or water pouring on it where it was stored somewhere, something like that, right? Almost every game is like that. So this particular one, let's see if we can see any, any uh, effects of that. A lot of times it will be around the top here. Let me turn down the brightness a little bit so you can see it a little less bleached out here. So a lot of times right on the edge at the top, you'll see it swollen a little bit. You can see this one is not very bad at all, so I don't know if it's ever been wet. If you see this, see how the, the, the light hits it? Might be a little bit of damage there. I'm not nitpicking, I'm just saying, since we're talking about it, might as well show it. And then let's look down on the floor. Now on the floor, a lot of times what would happen is it would be from flooding, or maybe from rain if it's in the back of a truck and it got wet, or it could also be from a mop. If it's in a certain location, the, you know, the janitor might mop the floor every night and rub the mop up against the side of it and get it wet. Um, so let's see if there's any obvious damage down here. Not really. So this is actually in pretty decent shape, you know. I don't know that it's ever been wet which is rare. A lot of times they have uh, they have uh, a lot of water damage. So this one's held up pretty well over the years. Pretty nice little cabinet, all things considered. Right? So let's look inside of it. So this is one of Atari's favorite monitors. It's a Matsushita. Matsushita. <laughs> I believe. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe this is the Hanter X. Oh, you know what? Um, I may be wrong about that. This may be the Hanter X. It's the TM202. I think that is the Hanter X. Okay, yeah, it's the Hanter X. I'm sorry. It's not the Matsushita. I'd like to see that stamped on there somewhere, though, so I know without having to go look. Hmm. Let's look on the neck board. Maybe it'll have the name. Boop, 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 boop. They do not have the name on it. The TM202, I believe, is the the Hanter Rex. Let me check to make sure. I always trust your instincts, people. It is the Matsushita, uh, which is the uh, you know became Panasonic, I believe. I think I got that right. Well, anyway, um, these things had issues, you know, they're not always the greatest monitor, but we've been getting a little better at repairing them, so uh, we'll probably be able to save that. Uh, so that's the original CRT. We'll have to do that in a separate video and just show you that. We did, we had a missile command one time that we uh, worked on with it. 
So here inside the cabinet, looking from the back, this is the steering. There's a gear uh, and a little sensor uh, board on there that can read the the uh, disc spinning around a little encoder. Um, this is the shifter. And then down here is the gas pedal. Now on the upright, it just had a gas pedal. On the sit down, it had a gas and a brake. I think I've got that right. Hmm. Let's look at the front. Make sure there's no brake pedal. I haven't had one in a while. Like I said, we don't mess with them. <laughs> but we're getting back into it. Yeah, it's just got a gas pedal. The, cock, the sit down has a gas and a brake. No clutch, people. You just have to... Just have the high low shift. Okay. So that's what we've got there. Speaker, one of the speakers. Um, we have a um, coin box assembly here with coin max, right? And then the vault is down in this case. And there is a little control panel, a uh, little control board there with two volume knobs, one for each speaker and a, a test switch and a service button. Service button would add credits to it. Okay, and then over here you have the this tunnel kind of that they built out of cardboard with an exhaust fan on it. And or uh, I don't remember which way that blows. Let's see. I don't know if, it, if it's an exhaust or an intake. Anyway, it's got a fan on it. It's, the whole purpose of it is to cool the board, which is down in here. The PC. The PCB. Okay, and then on here in the bottom, you have Atari's famous AR2 power brick, or whatever you call it. Um, so you got a transformer and fuses, and then you have a big blue, bit large capacitor here. And another big blue here. The reason that there's two in this game, on well, most of the Ataris there was one, is because there's actually two power supplies in pole position. Like I said, the game was very complex. It's running a lot of stuff, and there, there are actually two power supplies to run it. So you have one over here, and then there's actually one mounted right here. Okay. This panel has been replaced at some point by somebody, but they did a pretty good job on it. Um... This goes in here, though, so you can't pull the cord out. Um, the uh, the connections... Da, 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 da. See how the, the power board has connections on that side that aren't hooked up? It's because they're not necessary. These, these AR2 power boards, you could swap from cabinet to cabinet, and there were different revisions of them. The one that goes in pole position only uses, like, one side of the power board, and you'll see that here in a minute because we're going to mess with the power supplies. Um... So someone has swapped in another one that's been rebuilt or whatever that has extra equipment on it that's not even needed in this game. Um, okay. And so uh, the two power supplies create the power, send it up to the game board, and then they go through this little harness. And the problem that you run into is the pins in here because of what's called the sense circuit on the power board run so much current through them that they burn up the pins on the edge of the board which makes a lot of resistance and it gets to the point where that that pin is actually the the little edge connector is actually burnt away and the power no longer gets on the board well whenever that does that you know as you get resistance you get less and less power and once it drops below about four and a half volts or something like that the game won't run anymore so that's the main problem that the things have is the connection to the power board, I mean to the to the PCB, the, the main game board, okay. Um, and then the, the the fan setup is because the board does run kind of hot. It's got a whole bunch of custom chips on it, and those custom chips cook, you know. So you, you got to keep it cool, not necessarily cold, <laughs> but it's got to be cool. So the gentleman we bought this from had already started. Um, doing some of the mods to the game. So he has cut a couple of the wires and then put a connector on it so that he can attach the power instead of through the edge connector through a, a like a spade connector on the edge of the board. We're going to mess with that and get that a lot better. Um, but in this video I think what we're going to do 
is show you the power supply setup um, and work through that. We're going to talk about the sense the sense circuit and the sense mod and uh, uh, what we're going to do and why we think that's the correct thing for us to do at least. You may disagree. Okay, so uh, that's kind of an overview of what's going on in the cabinet. Basically, this brick down here creates the power, sends it unregulated, sends it to these regulator boards, uh, which also serve as audio amps, um, and then the regulator boards send the power up to the game board to work, which is mainly 5 volts. That's the one that is usually the problem. Uh, so I'm going to pull out this one, maybe, the one behind here, and uh, we're going to put it on the bench and look at it, and you can get a better look at the, at the power supply and what, uh, what we need to do to make the thing reliable. Notice we're not even messing with the board yet because not many people repair those. And if you get a working board, if you slide it in this cabinet, it's not going to work right with this, this power setup still screwed up. So we've got to get the power right, and then we can move on to the game board. Um, the two big blue uh, um, capacitors have been replaced. They're actually literally big black capacitors now because they're newer ones. Uh, that's often a problem uh, where you, you need to swap that, but someone has already done that. And all this looks pretty clean and everything. We'll check the fuse values and make sure that we're getting the right voltages out of it. But uh, we want to do the mod on the uh, power board. So I'll pull this one out and we'll put it on the bench and we'll talk about it a little bit. We're basically just trying to get the power right before we mess with the board or the monitor or the controls or all of that. We like to start uh, out of the wall with the power stuff first, make sure that we got a good uh, base to build everything else off of. So the actual CPU board is two big boards that are huge that you uh, that that run the game. We'll do a whole other video on that. They get hot and burn up the edge connector. But I wanted to show you uh, this power supply. So it was mounted in there just like this. Do you see the heat here? Look at this stuff here. Now, why is it like that? It's because the sense, the sense circuit, has uh, really screwed up on this because of a dirty connection at the edge connector. Now, keep in mind, this is likely not even the power supply out of this board. This was a pro out of this game. This was a. It's probably been swapped out of another one. This is this is common with a lot of the Atari games, okay? So this is part of the sense circuit. So we got to talk about that a little bit and then show you why we're going to do what we're going to do, okay? This board appears to have been worked on a little bit. It still has the original voltage regulator. A lot of people suggest swapping that. Look, that one's actually from the 52nd week of 1979. So, <laughs> so it's a little older, people. When these go bad, sometimes they short in such a way that instead of regulating 12 volts to 5 volts, they don't die. What they do is they short so that the 12 volt input is put out as 12 volts. So you lose your um, your 5 volt. Everything on the board, the, PC, the PCB that gets 5 volts gets 12 volts. Not good. <laughs> that will fry every freaking thing. With that said... You know, the people that say to swap these, I, I just, it's hard for me to swap parts that are still working um, and then put a newer part in it that, you know, is likely from China. I mean, I just, I don't really have a good record with that. So if this thing is still testing as working, I'm putting it back in, okay? I'm not going to be replacing that unless it's bad. Uh, but we're going to look in the schematics so I can show you about this resistor. Now notice this is R30, okay? And then up here is another one, R29. All right, so let's go look at the schematics so I can show you what we're thinking about doing and what we're going to do. So here is the schematics for pole position. But most of the Atari games are just like this, so here's how it works. The big blue capacitor is tied across the 10 volt rail, and so it sends an unregulated 10 volts in, right? And then this circuit creates the 5 volts regulated that basically everything runs off of, okay? So this is 5 volts regulated. 5 volts returned is basically ground, okay? They actually call it ground over here, okay? So you've got your 5 volts and your ground. 
Now there's other voltages and stuff too, but that's basically it. Okay, but it has this sense circuit. Now the the, uh, the resistor that was burnt up is R30. So why is that resistor burnt up? It's because there was a bad connection on the ground going into the PCB. And again, this is very common on a lot of Atari games. The idea behind this circuit was we send out 5 volts on this uh, rail right here, okay? And there is an adjustment right here to adjust the 5 volts, okay? So you, you send out 5 volts to the board, and you go down to the wiring harness, and then it connects to the edge connector, and there may be some resistance at the edge connector. So what gets on the board might actually be 4.8 volts. So the way you combat that is you connect another wire called a sense wire to send voltage, the 4.8 volts, back to the power supply. And then the power supply is wired in such a way that it can see that there's only 4.8 volts coming back, right? And it goes, hey, wait a minute. It's only sending 4.8 volts out, or it's only getting 4.8 to the board. Let's turn up the 5. So it automatically adjusts because it sensed that the voltage was low. And now instead of sending out 5, it might send out 5.2 or something until this sense line is 5. And then it says, okay, well, now we know that 5 volts is actually making it to the board. And so it was a way to try to make it self-regulating, like self, uh, where, to where this adjustment wasn't necessary, that it would do it on itself. Okay, and that was meant to take up for if there was any kind of, look, I've got dirt all over me, I've been working on these games, uh, if there was any kind of uh, bad connection. But here's what happens. If you get a bad connection on one of the main rails, so like if this connection on the board... Um, is uh, just isn't isn't connected at all or whatever. Basically, it will pull so much current through this little uh, wire that it burns up the connector on the board. Um, and if it, whenever it doesn't do that, it also sends current or the ground. You know, there, there's two here. There's actually the one across the ground, and then this R twenty one nine is the one across the five volt. It will send so much current through this little quarter watt resistor that it burns it up. So, this is like a really common problem. There is a way, or a couple ways actually, to get rid of the sense circuit. Okay, so if you get rid of the sense circuit, then what do you have? Well, now whenever it sends five volts, so basically you're shorting it so that the thing always thinks that it's sending five volts and that it's receiving five volts, right? So then if you send in five and you only get four point, let's say you only get four volts at the board, it's not going to burn the connector. Well, it still might burn that connector, but it's, it's not going to burn up the resistor and it's not going to burn the connector and turn the voltage way up. Um, it just, it isn't going to work right. The game's not going to work. So you're, it, you're going to lose the ability for the, for the power supply to self-regulate and turn up the voltage. If it's sending out five, it will never send more than five unless it, you know, regulator shorts or something. It'll stay like that. It won't go up and down. It won't fluctuate or adjust itself. Um, so if you end up where the board is not running, you can go over and figure out why it's not running, which is typically a bad connection um, on the edge connector. You can see on this one that we've repaired that it, it burns the, the pins right, literally right off the board. Those have been repaired, but very common on Atari games and very common on pole position. It just takes so much juice too, right? Uh, so, we want to get rid of the sense circuit. Now, I'm not saying they shouldn't have done it. I'm just saying that it's not really necessary for what we're doing, right? If the game doesn't run, we can check the 5 volts at the board, and if it's low, we can clean the edge connector until we get our good 5 volts on the board. That's just how we're going to do it. We don't need it to regulate itself. A lot of people swear up and down by this thing, right? To hell with it. I'm, <laughs> on some games, maybe it's good, but on this one, we're shorting it out. So how can you short this out? Well, there's a couple ways. On the connector, you can just short these two together. And so what that is basically going to do is it's going to make it where the 5 volts that the board is creating 
it is also sensing is what's coming back from the board. So it'll just leave it at that because it's going to sense that it's getting 5 volts back. Okay, and the same on the ground. You can short these two connectors together. Another thing you could do is you could take R30 and just replace it with a jumper, the one that burns up. That would also short the two together. You could do the same with R29. Okay, so there's a couple different ways you can do it. The way I usually do it is I short it on the connector because it's really easy. Uh, so I'll show you how we do that. And by doing that, like I said, I, I think that's going to get rid of some of the problems and it's going to make it more rock steady. And you can also imagine, instead of this being a return where it is sending uh, the sense line back, you're now making it a second rail in, right? So now you're going to have 5 volts coming in on these connectors on the game board and you're also going to have it coming in on the sense connection on the game board. Let me show you the, what the, the uh, edge wiring is supposed to look like on the game. So here's the power supply, the board we're working with. See, it sends 5 volts out. And you get two connections onto the board, two pins, given 5 volts. The board then has the sense rail attached to the 5 volt rail on the board. And then it uses it to send a little, it's a smaller wire, so it sends where the, the, regu the regulator can basically read what the voltage is on here. If we were to short these together on the board or at this connector, now when it sends out 5, it's also sending 5 on this, this line. So you're basically adding a third 5 volt uh, source from the power supply. So we're going to do that, and then we're also going to clean up all the connectors, make everything rock solid the best as we can, test the power on the board, turn it up if we need to with the... With the uh, potentiometer, etc., etc. So, To me, on pole position, this is just the only way to fly. I think this makes a lot of sense, but clearly, I'm not an expert. I just play one on YouTube. So let me show you how to, how to do the easiest sense mod, if you decide that you want to do that on yours. If you look right there, it says plus sense. There's a, on some of them, there's a little uh, test uh, loop there. That is the line that is the sense, the positive sense line. And then if you look here, see where it says positive? This is the 5 volt rail underneath the board, okay? So when you flip it over, this is the 5 volt rail coming from over here, uh, the resistor off the regulator. So that's the 5 volt rail over here. There's the potentiometer to adjust it and stuff. There's the voltage, the other one. Um, so you get up here, blah, blah, blah. So that is the 5 volts into the connector. This is the ground here. So, see the little two little things? That's that little test point that we were just showing for the positive sense. Okay? So, if you short this line to this line, they're permanently shorted. The easiest way to do it is just to connect these two, connect that post to there on the connector. Once you've done that, you are now sending the five also out the line that was meant to be for the sense. Okay? Now on the negative, you've got the ground here, okay, and then this one above it is the actual negative sense. See that little connector there? That's where the test point for the negative sense is. So if you connect that one to that one, you have now shorted the ground as well, and you've done the sense mod. Easy peasy. So it says sense, negative sense. Okay, so let me short those two and I'll show you how it looks. Okay, so it's 20 seconds later. So I now have the ground connected to the ground sense. And I have the 5 connected to the 5 sense. Okay. Now, again, I'm trying to be as careful as I can about this. This will not fix your game. I'm not doing this to fix the game. I'm doing this to make the game more reliable long term, in my opinion. Okay. This will never burn up again. It can't because the, the voltage is on both sides of it now. So this will never burn up again. This R29 one will never burn up again either. So we fix that where that won't be an issue in the, in the future. But if you've got a bad connection on your, on your uh, game board, you will still have the problem where you don't have 5 volts going on the board. It, you know, so that's not going to fix anything. It's just going to keep it from becoming a problem down the road. It's more like a preventative maintenance thing. Um, so th this is not a fix, you know, if you're, if you're having problems with your game and you do that, it will definitely not fix it. It's not going to change anything. If anything, it'll lower the voltage that you have on the game board.
And if this is burning up, it's not because the sense mod needs to be done. It's because you've got a bad connection on your game board. I'm just making it so that instead of this burning up to tell you you've got a bad connection on the game board, now the game not booting will tell you that you have a bad connection on your game board. So if you don't understand why we're doing that, don't do it. You know, make sure you, you it's real simple, but I understand that it, if it's foreign to you because you haven't worked on these and you, you're not good with power supplies or whatever, um, that it, it might not make any sense. So if it doesn't, you might want to just leave it the way it is, <laughs> right? All right, so we've got that. I'm going to pull the other one out. We're going to do the same thing. I'll show you the slight differences on that board. Um, basically, this stuff over here is just populated, but it, it's not connected. Um, and then uh, we'll put them back in the game, and we'll test the power to see if we've got good power coming out, good 5 volts coming out of both. Here's the other one. You can see that the resistor has been replaced at some time on it as well. Right? So I've done the same simple mod to it. Someone has replaced the 3055 on it. And then this side isn't even used in this game. You can see this says dash zero two. They made several different versions of this board. Um, with a, it, They're all kind of the same part number and it says dash zero one, zero two, zero three, zero four. I think there's seven of them or something like that. Uh, but pretty much all of the Atari games for quite a while use this same board. It's the AR2 board. Audio regulator. You know, that's. I always thought that was kind of weird too. Everybody calls it the AR2 board, but it's really the regulator audio 2 board. So it would be the RA2 board, but whatever. Okay, here's the first one. This is the regulator audio board. This was the one before that. So this is the one for uh, asteroids. Or. Um, there was an Asteroids one, there was an Asteroids Deluxe one where this connector is a little different. And then they probably used it on other games too, but I just don't get anything um, around that timeline too much that's not an Asteroids or an Asteroids uh, Deluxe. So this was the first one. And you can see how they basically... Um, just extended the thing out. To make to make the the two board, so it's it's just the the whole thing's fascinating, really. Just the way they um, they designed things back then. Very cool. But the the other one that we had earlier, remember, none of this was on there, so it was just there's just a PCB sticking out with nothing on it. Very cool. All right, so I did the sense mod on this one. Everything looks cool. You can see the the potentiometer is a little bit different. Uh, the resistor has been replaced by somebody, but that's unnecessary now with the mod. Uh, and both of these had been tested working, supposedly. They're both labeled as repaired and tested working, so they probably are. Uh, but we're going to test them when we put it back in just to see that we're getting 5 volts out of each of them. One of them powers the CPU board, one of them, uh, and the other one powers the video board, which are on the same PCB stack, right? Um, so let's go slide this one back in the cabinet. So we got a mount enter looking in the schematics. The so this is the first uh, power supply. The ground wires are red and green. So there's one there, and then there's another one there. Red and green. The five volt wires are red and white. I believe those are two of the ones that were cut on the harness. And so over here, this is the video board, which the other power supply powers, right? Same thing. The ground wires are red and green and the 5 volt wires are red and white. Okay. So that's what we're looking at. So we're going to measure between the red and green wires and the red and white wires at the connector to the board and just see if we have anywhere near 5 volts and if we can adjust that um, to get it at 5 or maybe 5.1 a little bit higher. Um, and that will allow us to have know that the powers the power supplies are fine and that we can uh, risk <laughs> plugging the board into it. One more thing I wanted to point out. I was talking earlier about how it makes different voltages. If you look though, the CPU board only runs on five volts. 
there is no other voltage necessary for the board to run. And then the video board also only runs on 5 volts. There's no other uh, voltage necessary. So the reason for that is because they send the audio unamplified back over to those same boards and then the audio, the uh, regulator audio 2 board um, amplifies it on the on the uh, regulator board. So there's no, there's no uh, uh, need for a different voltage if they can have all the chips run off of 5 volts on the board. Okay, folks, we got them both mounted back in. Turn the cabinet on. I've got the monitor unplugged for now. No need to worry about the, uh, you know, 30,000 volts up above my head when I'm messing with this. <laughs> Pieces at a time, people. That way we know it's reliable, right? And again, the big blues have been replaced. That's pretty critical, really, On uh, if, you, if you've got one that's acting up. You can measure across the uh, terminals and see if you're getting a bunch of AC ripple on it uh, to, to check it, but... It's a good idea to, to swap those. They're 40 years old at this point, okay? Um, and they, they regulate all of the, the, the I mean, not regulate, uh, they filter all of the 5 volt for the cabinet. So again, this thing has been cut, but we're going to put the ground in that pin. Then I'm going to check on the red and white wire without freaking electro killing myself. We've got 5.07 volts. Um, on that one. Now, the grounds are all tied together because they all come from the uh, down here. I'll prove that here in a minute. But so basically, you can leave the ground connected to that one. So we got 5.07 on the one power supply, and then this second one, we've got 5.11. That's very close. Um, so I think that'll be fine for now. We, you know, one board may draw more power than the other one anyway. So we'll leave it like that. Um, so I think we're good to try the boards whenever we get them repaired. But unfortunately, they have all kinds of problems uh, with the uh, with the edge connector. So we got to fix all that first. Um, so we'll do that on a separate video. I think the last thing we'll do in this one is we will attempt to turn on the monitor to just see if that's going to give us problems too or if it's good to go. Plug that in, got nice strong neck glow. Look at the filament burn. Burn baby burn. Can't see uh, if we've got any high voltage on the tube. We do. The monitor has held on all these years, people. Holy crap! Wow! We'll see if it catches on fire while we're sitting here looking at it. All right, so there you go. We will do a our next video. We will work on that board. It's got some battery damage. It's got some uh, the, all the chips are dirty. The edge connectors need to be repaired. We'll fix all of that on the next board, and then we'll test it and see if the board is still hanging in there or if we're going to have to do some uh, some troubleshooting on it, but hopefully not too much. So what do you think so far? Leave your comments below. Let us know what you think. Make sure to give us a thumbs up for taking the trouble to film it for you. Uh, check out our website. Go to lionsarcade.com. We have pictures, prices, and descriptions of all of our arcade games that we have available for sale and our pinball machines and our jukeboxes on there. Go check that out. Make sure to subscribe to our channel if you haven't. When you're on our website, there's a parts page. If you click on that link, it'll take you to some of the, the uh, items that we use whenever we do repairs. Um, and some of those links are uh, for like our t-shirts and stuff like that too. But if the uh, link takes you to Amazon and you buy anything on Amazon after clicking our link, Amazon knows that we sent you there and they, uh, they give us a tip. So uh, we appreciate everybody that's been uh, buying things under our account. Wait a minute. Don't do that. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Don't buy it under our account. <laughs> so we appreciate everybody that's been doing that. It looks a little green. We'll have to adjust that out if we ever get the board running. Um, but what do you think? What do you think so far? Don't forget, too, to subscribe to my brother, Donnie. If you haven't seen that yet, literally, my brother, Donnie, has a channel here on YouTube. If you like watching us work on these old arcade games, you'd probably like watching us work on old buildings. He and I have bought a couple small buildings near here in an old uh, downtown, old-timey 
uh, buildings that we're fixing up trying to help revitalize downtown. So go check that out. You may enjoy it. All right, folks, I think this is a good start, though. We've got the power supply is nice and solid. We did the sense mod. Everything's cool. We've measured the voltages. We're ready to mess with the boards now. We're up to that point, and we even know that the monitor works. Somewhat. <laughs> All right. I'm sure it's going to need a little help. But uh, stay tuned. We'll see you on the next video.